It ain't loud enough Been plugged in, I'm powered up Got more time in, I'm powered up Blessings coming down, I'm showered up We got the fame and the name, yeah you heard of us Ways you can do the same, you ain't heard enough We'll grab a seat, grab a plate, yeah we serving up Won't cost a thing, free game, yeah we serving up Yeah, amp it up, loud enough 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 No Roper, I am the director of Amplifier, so we thank you all for coming. I'm excited about this. We've been talking about this for about a year. Yes. So we finally got it done. Now, I know there are a few of you who are watching online and also here in the space. You may be wondering, what are these two programs and why are they doing it together? Okay? So, I am the coordinator for our teen music education program, which is what we have here once a month in this space, and we bring in special guests to teach you guys about the music industry and also allow you guys space to have a teen open mic where you can share your gifts with our audience. And Chad has the other component of that for our all ages program. Go ahead, bro. And Amplifier is an educational piece where we teach you about business, mental health, also uh, financial literacy, and the music industry. So what we do is we bring in different specialists in each area that I name, and we sit down and have a conversation with them. A lot of times, uh, we have a packed house, but we really have a really packed house online. So I want to make sure that we collaborate it so that we can get the feel of both. And I'm excited to hear what y'all got going on live for us today because we don't have that portion because it's more adults. You know, adults, we think we cool. We too cool. But that's why I'm, I want to do this so that I can hear what you guys are doing. So I'm looking forward to it. So you guys should know that Music Lab and Amplifier both work hand in hand for the local Milwaukee community. We are here for the young ones, for the teens, to get your feet wet. And then when you're graduated from stuff and you still want more artist development, that's what Amplifier is here for. So I'm glad you guys can see what both programs can have components over. And you can follow us at gwmusiclab.com. And mmke.org. This is our very special collaboration for Women's History Month. We are so excited to bring up our guests, but first we want to thank the people who are making it possible for us to be here. Amplifier is sponsored and supported by... Milwaukee Mics. You'll see these fly mics we holding up right here? Yeah. Yeah, these are Milwaukee Mics, so we want to shout them out for showing us love and being yes. a part of our, 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 our program. We official like a whistle. So Music Lab is all... Oh, Music Lab and Amplifier are both presented by Hyphen our urban alternative radio station here in Radio Milwaukee. Make some noise for Hyphen, y'all. Hey. And, of course, I want to thank our special Music Lab supporters, including American Family Insurance, Daniel M. Soar of Charitable Trust, Kobe Foundation, Ralph Everwood Foundation, Greater Milwaukee Association of Realtors Youth Foundation, NPS Partnership for the Arts and Humanities, as well as our community partners, Ronald Reagan High School, Milwaukee High School of the Arts, Peak Initiative, and Running Rebels Community Organization. Food support will be here. It's coming. <laughs> and it's going to be provided, of course, by our very own Ian's Pizza, providing a variety of classic vegan and specialty slices in any one of the three Milwaukee locations, Eastside, Downtown, and Story Hill. For more info, at Ian'sPizza.com. All right. So, Music Lab is getting started. Amp is getting started. But when we move on to this and we have all this fun stuff, we also have a very special giveaway. Every person who was under 18 received a raffle ticket. So, make sure you hold on to that because at the end of the session, we're going to be raffling off our Music Lab gear. So, you get a chance to get a t-shirt or a hoodie. So, it's very, very cool. Nice for the weather outside. So, make sure you stick around, guys. You guys ready to get started? Let's get to it. I am very excited. You see all the stuff on stage? Man, we, have, got, we have a night to be had, okay? Our special guest is going to be, bring, bring it up now. My, uh, you know. Our special guest of bringing up now is Miami born and raised, who is swiftly burgeoned the most prolific sound engineers. 
Starting at the hit factory fresh out of Full Sail University, she gained immediate favor from Missy Elliott and Tim Blinn. She became their go-to mixer during that time and also met now Grammy award-winning producer Danger. 21 years later, she is credited for mixing over 100 chart-topping tunes. She's had the opportunity to work with world-renowned music icons such as Beyonce, Britney Spears, Madonna, Nelly Furtado, Ursha Baby, Jennifer Lopez, Romeo Santos, and Justin Timberlake. She currently holds positions as a trustee of the Recording Academy Grammys, steering committee member of Producer and Engineers Wing, and an advocate of organizations such as We Are Moving the Needle and Girls Make Beats. She speaks at universities and panels around the U.S., educating students on music engineering and navigating the music business. In her work, she aims to bring the spotlight to designers behind the board and actively advocates for the next generation of music stars. You guys, please make some noise and welcome Marcella Mislago Areca. Hey. Woo! Come on down. Come on down. I know, fancy, fancy, aren't we? This is a first time for me. Other way, trying to go. Yep, there you go. Like the studio. As an engineer, and I don't even know. Ain't that something? This is new. Hey y'all. Oh my gosh, let's do that one more time. Okay. Hey y'all. There we go. I love it. Now, I just want to say this moment is monumental because, one, you guys have to understand how incredible this woman is. Once you go and do your research after this, because no, you will, you're going to be like, wow, I was in the same room with her? My gosh. Also, this is our very first collab with Amp and Music Lab, and I've been wanting to get my one to the park on with him for a very long time, so I'm yes, very happy with yes, this. Yes, yes, yes. AJ and free. AJ yes. and be free. Yes. <laughs> So this is just a com casual conversation that we're going to be leading with Marcella. But if there are any questions that you guys out there in the audience have that you wish for her to answer, then just shoot your hand up and we'll be sure to answer them as well. I always like to kick off our music lab component with one particular question, which I think you have a really nice information about, which is aside from what you got going on now, a lot of the people we have in the audience are kids or teens between right. 13 and 18. So can you tell us... What were you doing around this age that led you into the direction that you're doing now? Are there any specific instruments you played or any key experiences or influences? What was age 13 to 18, Marcella, into? Oh, my God. I love this question because it's never been asked before. Oh, okay. And it actually makes me think. But, I mean, I have thought about it because, you know, I, I have to think about my journey from time to time. From 13 to 18, I mean, from, what, from even before that, I, I was – very enamored with music, just listening, mm -hmm. right, as a, as, as a consumer, and just really wanting to kind of be like inside the speaker, right, really yeah. understand that sound, why is it doing this, why are the sounds low, high, like what's making all that, that fusion happen that, that makes us feel, as, you know, that emotional state. And for me, you know, I tinkered around with playing on keys, um, and I say tinkered because I had a, a piano teacher, uh -huh. and she wasn't very nice. So she, <laughs> very, she discouraged me from even wanting to, to learn to play because I just associated it with, like, ugh. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want, like, she literally, like, if I would play, like, a bad note, she'd be like, you don't hear that? And she would, like, twist my, <laughs> yeah. she would twist the top of my ear, and I'd be like, all right, this isn't right. what I want to do. Um, I did uh, in middle school, which is about, what, the end of thir 13, I was still like in middle school. I was in the theater, so I was kind of playing around with, do I, I, I love, I like this, the, the, the express, like I love expressing myself, but anytime I got on the stage to perform, the lights, the people out there, I would be like, Ugh! <laughs> and so I realized, okay, well, I love to sing, but I'm not the best singer, but I know more than anything, I don't like to perform. Okay. So, you know, as I got into high school, for me, it was like, I want to be in the music business. I want to be in the music business. What can I do? The engineering did not come to me right away at all until after high school. So for me, I just hung around with like-minded people that, you know, rapped, played, you know, instruments, made beats. I just was around a music scene. Yeah. And really, like, that just kind of carried me into finding um, Full Sail eventually after high school. Nice. Yeah. 
So we're always telling folks here in the music app audience that it's really important to surround yourself with like-minded individuals, which is why we hold this space for you guys as well, because everybody in here has either some concentration or interest in the same things. And they might not go to the same school as you, might not be in the same neighborhood, but you all can definitely connect here. Absolutely. Yeah. So what, what were some of your skill sets that you used that helped get you into the industry? To get me into the industry, persistence. I'll tell you that was the number one skill because when you say get into the industry, yes. we're talking after I, I, I graduated Full Sail. So when I attended Full Sail, it was, it's a, I don't know if you guys know what Full Sail is. It's I was going to say, yeah. So Full Sail is a, a real world education school where you, well, I went over 20 years ago, but it's still the same concept today. So basically, it's an accelerated college program where I, at the time, they were only offering two year degrees that you could get in one year. So I got an Associate's of Science degree in Recording Engineering, but I did it in one year. And once I started Full Sail, like, I started thinking right off the bat, okay, I have one year here, and that's going to go by pretty quick. So what do I, what's the plan after? So about three months into the program, I started thinking, like, where do I want to go? Do I want to end up in New York for a job? Do I want to go to L.A.? Or do I want to stay home base in Miami? Well, for me, it made more sense to stay home base because I needed to save a little more money after I graduated, right? It's kind of like... Ain't nothing wrong with that. Yeah, it's like, let me just stay with the parents and I can just kind of build my money up. So I started kind of researching um, where I wanted to be and I found a few places, but the one place that I wanted to be at was the Hit Factory because it just, it's a legacy studio. It's been there for, at this time, I had been there for almost 50 years, okay? Like, there was everybody from James Brown, the Beatles, I mean, everybody has been through this, uh, you know, Whitney Houston, like, it was an insane wow. studio. So for me, it was like, all right, how do I get in there? Well, let me write to the studio manager and let me introduce myself. I have nothing to offer but an introduction, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a student, I'm graduating in nine months. Um, but when I graduated, I'm, just, I'm interested into an in, I'm interested in getting an internship, and you know it was kind of like all right, yeah, great, nice to meet you, thanks for the letter, move on, right? Like, <laughs> so six months into my program, I called and I said, hi, you know, I wanted to know if you guys would be interested in, I could if I can get a tour of your studio, right? If I drive down and I can get I, when I say drive down, full cell was up in Orlando, Florida, so this is down in Miami, three hour drive. So I'm like, I would like to drive down and, and take a tour of the place and just check it out. Well, the studio manager was like, sure, schedule it with my assistant manager, which I did. Came down one weekend. Now I got to see. Now it was no longer what I heard. Now I actually got to see it. I was like, whoa, this is even better than I thought. This, is, this place has six studios in it. I mean, history, music history beyond years, decades of music history. I'm like, I have to end up here. So... Nine months into the program, did the same thing. Like, oh, I have three months left. That I still got brushed off. Now three weeks left before my graduation date. I called and I said, look, I'm three weeks out from graduation. Mm -hmm. Remember me. I would like to have a job if it's available. He's like, I'm sorry, there's no availability. <laughs> there's nothing here. So I um, basically was like, all right, well, now I got to weigh out other options. I mean, listen, I wasn't just putting all eggs in one basket. I was just putting a lot of energy into this one basket. Yeah. But I definitely was kind of, you know, having small, like, little feelers out in the meantime. But nothing that I really wanted more than the Hit Factory. Well, after that three-week call that they told me they didn't really have anything, I said, well, now I really got to go hard in the paint. Mm -hmm. I got to figure out where I'm going to end up because I'm about to graduate. I knew that the odds were against me pretty much because when I went to Full Sail, I didn't realize I was entering such a male-dominated industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got my first taste of it while I was in school because the classes were so predominantly male-heavy. We were uh, 150 kids in our lecture classes. Only four or five of us were female. Mm -hmm. So it was like, okay. And then we were told from constant people, like, there's not a lot of women that do this. There's not a lot of women that yeah. do this. And so I was like, okay, well, I have to, I have to do this because, like, I had to actually, like, make sure my parents, like, first of all, my parents were not in the best, uh, they didn't really want me to do what I was doing. Okay, let's just say that. They were like, right. Now you had a lot to prove. What? Right. Yes, yeah. I was like, I have to prove this. Like, I cannot fail. And so I basically was like, all right, graduated. Now I'm, like, trying to send out resumes of some sort. 
And then maybe about two weeks after graduation, I got the call from the Hit Factory to come in for an interview and got the job. So I would say my skill set was <laughs> persistent. Absolutely. I was going to say, right? yes. Now, me being in the studio, that, that came later. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> like, yeah. That came later because, you know, if anybody knows, uh, music industry, like a lot of it is you have to show and prove yourself. Right. So a lot of your first jobs is not going to be your dream position, job. My first job, get my, the job that I really wanted, guess what it was? I was running food. I was making flower arrangements, making fruit baskets, handing clients coffee. Like, I was doing everything except touching wires uh -huh. and hooking up mics and being on the board or Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. So, but that was okay for me. I, w I was in the door. That's all I needed. There you go. Yeah. I will say, like, you guys have had cross paths obviously way before this so if there's anything that you have want to specifically ask or say that fits in with all of this gotcha. feel free absolutely i don't want to monopolize the end of the conversation no problem so so <laughs> and everything she i'm a grammy nominated engineer and producer so as modest. well yeah. but yeah. what what she say is saying is yes. <laughs> we, were, we were talking on the way from the airport about this and we were talking about how different the starts were but they had similarities but what we both understood was our best ability was being available. So mm -hmm. always remember in your in your careers and the things you want to do, your best ability is being available. If you're available for the opportunity, you can take advantage of the opportunity. But in taking advantage of the opportunity, you must be prepared for the opportunity. She said she went to school. I, would, I was not a go-to-school engineer. I was what we call a hood engineer where I was <laughs> working with all of the hood, the ghetto artists, the rappers, the any whoever wanted to work. That's how I honed my skills. And I, I had to engineer because the engineers that I was working with couldn't give me the sound I wanted. So I had to teach myself how to get the sound I was hearing in my head. So it's two different worlds. Now, mind you, she's worked with way more superstars than me. But I worked with uh, some Ushers and some Beyonce's yeah, yeah. and some Rihanna's, too. A great resume. Yes. Right. But the thing is, we both did, had similar paths, worked with a lot of the same artists, but it was two different arenas. So... I would, if I had could do it all over, I would go through the hard knock life version of what I did and then also go to full cell too to mix the two. It's like having a piano player that can play by ear, but then they learn to read music. Mm -hmm. One thing you can't teach is feel. You understand what I'm saying? You can learn technique, but you can't teach feel. So I love everything she said. Go ahead, be free. I love it. Thank you. No, I'm, uh, I'm like that we're planting these seeds, too, because like, I feel like there are a lot of people in here that are probably thinking about what's coming after high school, but they're getting ready to graduate in a couple of months. So if you already have an idea, maybe this is planting the seed of, I need to be a little bit more persistent with letting them know that I'm here, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Can, I, I think it's important, too, like, just really start building that roadmap, right? Yeah. Because, you know, like I just said, like, it's, you have to be able to, especially, like, when you're young like that, Mind you, I said after high school, but when I say after high school, it was a few years. It was uh, like two and a half years after high school when I found Full Sail. I mm. wish I had it the moment I graduated high school. Absolutely. And I was like, all right, I'm in here, you know, because I would have been, it would have been a lot better, you know. Mm -hmm. But I struggled trying because, and the reason why that path happened for me was because I, you know, the opportunities 20 years ago are not the opportunities that are available today. So 20 years ago, when I was telling my guidance counselor or anybody that was asking me, what do you want to do when you graduate high school? And I say, I want to be in the music business. I want to, I want to do something. And they'd be like, well, what, what, like, there's no opportunity. So I, closed door, mm -hmm. you know, there was an opportunity or there wasn't any, like, there, like, it was like a secret society to get yeah. into the music industry, right? And there was no programs available. Fast forward 20 years later, there's so many networking opportunities and programs and opportunities, just anything that really can allow you to get that first foot in. Mm -hmm. So that you guys already have that, that mm -hmm. you know, that, that upper, one up. that, yeah. Yeah, that one up because all you need to do is get in. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it becomes a, stair a staircase to start climbing up, given the chance that you take that opportunity the right way. And then once you get in, always remember this. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Yeah, That's a hard. rare thing in the music industry because we came across a lot of people that tell us, oh, we're going to link up, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Yeah. Then you never hear from them. Then you see them at the Grammys or something and then they want, oh, we're we going to, you know what I'm saying? Like It happens all the time. Same. So if you say you're going to do something, make sure you follow through because that's going to take you further than anything that you can do besides your, your, your skill set. It's the intangibles that make Kobe Bryant 
or LeBron James or Michael Jordan who they are. It's the intangible things. Everybody can shoot the basketball. Everybody can dunk. But it's those other areas, the heart that they have, the courage that they have, the willingness to fail that they have that takes them to the next level. So make sure you add that to your repertoire as well. The intangibles will take you further than any title you'll ever get. Y'all hear me on that one? You better give it up a chance. Give it up a chance, y'all. That's a word. I love how holding conversations with him because you're always going to get something like that out of it. There's a huge gem waiting to be picked up. So speaking of gems, you guys also receive surveys on the way in here. They're paper surveys and pens. Please make sure you are filling those out during the session. We're going to be collecting them at the front table when you're done. Make sure we can see what you're learning from today, but also what you might want to see more of so we can keep that in mind for our future sessions. FYI. So you talked about, in our, in our bio I read, uh, we listed a lot of names, but I know that it was really specific uh, ties to how you started linking with folks like Timbaland. I think he was credited as one of your music mentors. So in the time that you were building up from that two, three-year period and doing being like the running man and getting all the things, what was, like I would say, your first prominent, okay, I'm behind the board in doing this situation to kind of prove yourself to lead to those other opportunities? Yeah, so, I mean, it was during my time with Timberland. Um, you know, he, I was actually an assistant engineer when I started working with Timberland for the Hit Factory, um, which basically was the person in the room that supported the main engineer with whatever task that was needed, uh, studio-related, which was either, like, you know, hooking up equipment, uh, patching in certain equipment into the mix or into the recording session, hooking up mics, whatever was needed. And so... I, he ended up signing um, an artist by the name of Carrie Hilson uh, back in 2004. He had a, a, you know, signed this young girl out of Atlanta with a, he co-signed her with a producer by the name of Polo Don. And so Carrie was out hanging out in Miami just kind of, you know, trying to figure out, where, <laughs> you know, when her time was going to be for her to record her music. You know, Timberland was very busy with big artists that had already, you know, labels that have already hired him to do stuff. So, you know, I started working with Carrie like a little bit before Timberland would walk into the studio. Like, let's say Timberland would say, tomorrow I'm going to come in at like 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Well, then Carrie and I and Danger, we would come in around 1, 2 p.m. So we would have about four to five hours on our own in the studio. Mm -hmm. And so by the time Tim would walk in, which would never be at 6 p.m., it'd be like <laughs> around 9 p.m., right. <laughs> 9, 10 o'clock at night, we had a full day of, you know, work in the studio. So once Tim would come in and start hearing some of the things that we worked on, he was impressed. He was like, wow, like, I love the way you have Carrie sounding. Like, I love the way you ha you're blending her vocals in the rough mix. Like, you're, this is incredible. Like, you guys should, you know, keep doing this. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, like, well, could we get another room? You know, because I'm, I'm an assistant. I'm only doing so much in the room. So I want to keep recording. Mm -hmm. And I said, could we get another room? And upstairs is a, a, an available a studio. And he said, yeah, why not? Go ahead. So got the budget to do, make that happen. And Carrie, myself, and Danger, young producer at the time, we went up there and we just started kind of, you know, just putting out records. Not putting yeah. out, but like recording them. Tracking yeah, them out. and it was from there where things just started to flow because once people started hearing the music that we were doing, in those sessions and the rough mixes that I was making, the word would like, you know, like Polo would have comments on it. Mm -hmm. And then Polo would hire me to do stuff for him. Like I'd be flown out to Atlanta, you know, and be mixing records for him. My very first mix was a mix that I did for Usher called, um, <laughs> it was called Hands and Feet. <laughs> 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 it was for a movie uh -huh. that he was, um, I think he, he, he started, and it was, it was called In the Mix. In the Mix. Oh, in okay. the Mix, yeah. Yeah. And so the, it, it, part of the soundtrack. And so very first mix, it was just a, a Danger-produced record, and, you know, a Carrie wrote on it, and uh, another writer, JQ, from the, the song The Clutch. Wow. You have the songwriting group, The Clutch. And, yeah, the, I had recorded the whole thing, and I had created a, a rough mix, and they loved it, and they were like, well, like, let's have – I guess they tried to have another mixer do it, mm -hmm. and it wasn't the, r the right result. And so I guess Usher was like, well, who did the rough mix? Yeah. And so it was like, it was me. And they're like, well, let's have her do it. And so that's how I really started to kind of really become, you know, wow, she can do both. Yeah. Like, it's not like she's just a dope recording engineer. She's an incredible mixer as well. Mm -hmm. 
or begin, you know, I'm not saying like I was like, you know, serving or anything out the gate, but like I definitely had my, I was, I knew what I was doing, mm -hmm. you know, and it was, it had nothing to do with, well, it had a lot to do with technical, but it wasn't, the approach for me is always a, a, a feeling, mm -hmm. you know, it was always a, the, 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 how I felt the music and that's how I worked on it to, to, to make sure that it would be the result that it was. That's a lot of initiative. Fact. I love that. Like you <laughs> talked about the preparation, like being ready for your moment, but yeah. the fact that you took the initiative to start working with them before he even got there led to being able to showcase what he probably wouldn't even known if we had just waited for him to come at six, quote unquote nine. So <laughs> that's wonderful. Exactly. Yeah. And no, I, and it's oh, sorry, okay. and then no, and even like it's. I never really thought of it that way until you just said it, and I'm just thinking like. Yeah, because even with Carrie, like, who knows how long she would have been right. waiting for her moment, mm -hmm. you know? And then it's like, for me to be like, well, we have a studio upstairs that's open, like, so that's actually kind of interesting. And the crazy part is, what Marcella don't know is, I met Carrie after she met them. I okay. met Carrie in Atlanta on a break when her in Danger, she came back talking about Danger Hands and uh -huh. Marcella. I didn't know who they were, oh. and I was with the Corner Boys and Rico Love. Ooh, so when she came you. back, she came back and played a song called... I hate heels that you, that that they did, uh -huh. and I was like, uh -huh. I hate heels. Look like how they feel. Like, it was so dope, but I was like, man, this is crazy. I'm like, who's the producer? Yeah. This is not Timberly. She was like, no, this is the, a young dude from Virginia named Danger, Danger uh -huh. and, yep. I, and and Marcella was the engineer. Nice. We didn't know it. This was twenty some years ago. We didn't know each other at the time, but wow. that's how I was introduced to her. And I said, wait, wait. This a woman? <laughs> That's what I said to her. I'm like, a woman did this? She's like, I'm like, man, I need to go sit up under her for a couple uh -huh. and then learn. And she explained the process of what she just explained to me mm -hmm. about how, how everything happened for her. And I was, it was, she was like, wait till you hear this song I got that's coming out. Mm -hmm. And it was something that they did together, which was crazy. Yeah. I feel like your, that reaction alone is really common because, yes. like she said, like it's such a, you, you, you're honestly surprised to hear yes. at that time, especially that there's a woman doing these amazing things. So mm -hmm. I love the fact that you were able to set a precedence with that. Mm -hmm. And everything that you've done thereafter has only opened up more doors for women to be able to come and follow yeah. in your footsteps. Um, it's still very much a male-saturated industry. Yes, it is. Um, but being able to have examples like that and being able to see that at such a young age, I think is important for people to get inspired for what kind of things they can do. And I always say, to me, if I had, when I have a company or all the companies I have, I would prefer to work with women because they are way more detailed than we will ever be. Especially with the Ruggles. Yeah, way, <laughs> way more detailed. When I started Amplifier, my only request was that I work with the woman. Guess who they gave me to work with? Be free. <laughs> <laughs> so out of all of these experiences and over the past two decades, um, what were some of the things that you say would have been like your most – amongst your most difficult to fight through being a, an original woman in the music industry and having to prove your worth and those sorts of things. What's a, something that was hard to bust through with that stereotype? I mean, it, it, there's so many different ones because, mm -hmm. you know, when I started at the, my first opportunity um, from be, becoming an intern into getting the assistant engineer seat, um, which is an extremely coveted role, especially coming from an intern because there were six interns there mm. and, and I was the youngest of them. Um, meaning like I had, I, like there was not an age, meaning like how, when I had started. Mm -hmm. And so from the minute I started to when I became an assistant engineer, it took me two months. Okay. And, and, and there were other interns that were waiting their turn for nine months, a year. And the only reason, the reason, I won't say the, well, the reason, right, that this happened was because I showed up to work, like I usually do, um, as the intern doing the morning shift, which was a 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. shift. And uh, I remember getting a call up to the studio manager's office asking me to come up. Um, thought I was in trouble. I was like, oh, boy, <laughs> what's going on? Yeah. Um, and he said to me, are you ready? And um, I just was thinking, like, what am, what am I ready for? I'm not sure what he's asking, but I'm going to say yes. I was like, yeah, I'm ready. What's up? And so he said, great, um, Missy Elliott's coming in the next 15, 20 minutes. I need you to set up her session, the mic, her hard drives, her, her sessions, everything that the engineer is going to need to get this session to run smoothly. Can you handle it? Because he had nobody else available because she had called 
and basically gave a 20-minute turnaround time. Mm. And he could not get anybody there that quick. So I said, yeah, I got you. No problem. I was there two months. Well, what came after that session, the session went smoothly. I was like, great, this was amazing. I met Missy. This was a dream come true. Now back to my interning life. <laughs> well, I guess that night or that morning, uh, the studio manager got a call, email or whatnot, that said, um, Missy loved Marcella uh, to, and wants her to continue to be the assistant in all her sessions. So basically, Missy was living in Miami working seven days a week out of the Hit Factory. Wow. So I became, by request, an assistant engineer for Missy Elliott. And so that came with a lot of hate. <laughs> I bet, yeah. Okay, a lot of just... Who's this year? Like, oh, wow. So, I can mix better than oh, that. no, she, oh, my God. Like, basically, you know, just everything from she only getting this because she's a girl mm -hmm. or she only getting this because Missy like girls or, you know, just the craziest things yeah. that were. But it was never of because I did a good job, right? Mm -hmm. So that was like, okay. Like, I just had to, like, you know, keep my, my focus forward. And then, you know, the difficulty is being in these rooms sometimes and, being the, you know, fast forward, now I'm an engineer in the room. I'm getting calls from the labels to work with certain artists like Chris Brown and, you know, just whomever. And then people walk in the room. I remember one time I was working with The Game in L.A. And The Game, he would come to the studio with an entourage yeah. of like 30, 40 mm -hmm. bangers, all right? Yeah. Like, Facts. <laughs> just streets. Like. And so I'm sitting in there just waiting, waiting, because I think they were like an hour or late or something. So they finally walk in, and everybody thought I was like, I don't know, somebody uh, somebody serve on the platter. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like, mm -hmm. I, I was anybody but the engineer in the room. Right. Mm -hmm. And so finally the game walks in, and he super nice, super polite, respectful. He's like, how you doing? Like, you know, introduced himself, and I introduced myself. He's like, oh, you, oh okay, dope. He's like, you're my engineer. Mm -hmm. And so the entourage was still in the background, and he had to kind of be like, man, y'all get out of here. Like, yeah. Because she's not here for that, like, mm -hmm. you know? And so this having that uncomfortableness, you know, and, and, and having to just still be, like, I didn't, like, let any of it, like, break me down. You know, I, I grew up with two brothers, so for me, like, being around, like, male energy was not, like, mm -hmm. anything big for me. But it's just you have to fight through it, right? Yeah. Or fight through anybody thinking that you're anybody but, like, oh, yeah. oh you must be the producer's girlfriend. Or, or you, th you know, like, nobody yeah. would believe that I'm the engineer, and it's just like... A part of me was like, it was like a gut punch, but at the same time, I would just kind of laugh it off because I'd be like, well, I just, I didn't care to be a f like the female in the room. Yeah. I just wanted to be the engineer. Mm -hmm. Like, let me do my job. My mm -hmm. job is to record the best possible sound. Like, stop making such a big deal of it being that I'm a woman, yeah. right, in the room. Mm -hmm. So it was things like that, you know, and, and just the, 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 the snide remarks. And, you know, um, the, 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 the pay was a thing, too, yeah. for a long time, like, trying to get that pay. I knew that certain colleagues at the same level as me was getting paid certain numbers, and when I would come around, they wouldn't match my number to that, you know? So it was, like, a lot of different things that I had to deal with, you know? I hate that that's still a thing in 2024. Yeah. Well, it, ain't, it ain't a thing for her. <laughs> oh, wait, no, 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 no. I, I asked her about missing the record of the other day. I said, girl, listen, I got to put it. I got to put that thing on the hillway. Uh, <laughs> got to put in that work. So. <laughs> I was going to say, no, the fact that the pay discrepancies is still a, a subject in all those oh, things. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. But, um, no, I, I totally feel you about the why can't I just exist in my skin and be great yeah. instead of this, like, oh, like in the constant disbelief is frustrating as well. Uh, I think cause I, I played a song called I Produce My Own Ish, remember? And it was made, birthed off of the fact that nobody believed that I produced my own music. And I was like, why? Why is, it, why is it so hard to believe? So the fact that your work has been able to speak for itself to the point where it's no longer, oh, she's a woman engineer or female. Mm -hmm. She's an engineer, beast one, period. Facts. I think is, is hugely and highly inspiring for a lot of people. Um, yeah. We've been run, rolling along, but if you guys have any questions at all for Marcella, Please raise your hand because I'll make sure I can get them answered. Hey, Autumn. What is the most popular song you have done? Ooh, what is the worst, po most popular song most you've worked popular on? Most popular song. Um, it would probably be Britney Spears' Give Me More yes. or Timberland's The Way I Are. Mm -hmm. 
one of the I two think, bangers. Two bangers. Yeah, yeah, I feel like they they came out around the same time, and we were topping the charts pretty much around that time and for a mm -hmm. few years mm -hmm. um, with a bunch of music that we were putting out. But I think, you know, like that Britney Spears album and that particular record is already in Rock and Roll's Hall of Fame. Nice. So, yeah. How about that? <laughs> cool. And the funny part is I studied that record. Yeah? The mix of it, yeah. Because mm -hmm. I was trying to steal... <laughs> Which I never knew it was her, but I was trying to steal what the in, mi, in, yeah. And <laughs> look at that. That uh -huh. record was mixed. What people don't realize is because I think around that time people really started to mix or started to mix in the box. Mm -hmm. um, I what do you mean by that? Sorry. In case oh, okay, so when I, mixing in the box is basically all in Pro Tools or all in a DAW in a digital audio workstation. Mm -hmm. So you're you're just completely working working inside of your computer. Well, for me, for many years, up until I think about six years ago, I was still working and mixing completely on an analog SSL 9000J console. Nice. And I only made that transition about six years ago, which was late <laughs> in the game yeah. of mixers because everybody would be like, you're still mixing on the console? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, if it ain't... Broke, why fix it? Yeah. Like, I <laughs> love the way my records sound, you know? And it took me a while to really make that transition. I had to make that transition because music was changing in a way where mm -hmm. I, I had to make that, that transition. But, mm -hmm. like, a lot of people don't realize, like, give me more, a, lo a lot, and all those records from back then. Up until six years ago, everything was mixed on an SSL 9000J console. Impressive. And a good thing is what she's saying is the in the box. I was an in the box mix engineer, so... I was able to figure out how to emulate what those engineers like her were doing on the boards. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this was pre the SSL plugins and all that. We would have to use the wave plugins to that's make impressive. it sound like an SSL. So that's how I learned how to mix listening to records like what she did on, the, on uh, her Jimmy Douglas, uh, what's the John Vinay, Horvat, KD, like KD, I mean, yeah, Duro. yeah, and I, I, mean, I would literally, I would literally just steal what they did and but make it fit within the box. So yeah. that makes sense. And I learned a new term today. Hopefully, you guys see it too. <laughs> yes. Uh, the artist KB? No, no, no. She was talking about an engineer. Yeah, yeah, Kevin Davis. Yeah, yeah. Kevin Davis. Yeah. KD. Okay, yeah. KD. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions out there? Yes, sir. That's a good question. Yeah, what were the easiest question. and hardest skills to learn as a mixing engineer? I repeat for the live stream. As a, as a record, as a just engineer period. Yeah. So I'll tell you something. Like being an engineer, the I'm going to tell you something. The easiest skill is learning the equipment. Facts. The hardest skill is the psychology of dealing with the people. That's a fact. <laughs> That's it. I'm telling you right now because you it's really uh, mm -hmm. something that they you just have to. Learn, you have to figure it out. Um, the chemistry and learning with, like, recording artists, like, really established ones or brand new ones that think that they've been established, the psychology of that is, it's mind-blowing. And you have to know how to navigate and, and just, and, and know how to, to speak up in a room or when not to speak up, right, depending on who's in the room. It's a, it, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a skill that is constantly... It's not something that, I mean, it's even today, like it's, you still work at it, right? Because times change and people have more opinions and they're, everybody knows everything. And it's like, all right, well, you know, I'm not, it's, do I speak? Do I waste my moment? Like, do I waste my time? That kind of thing. The equipment, um, you know, it's, that comes, you know, like you, you can really just, as long as you keep putting in the hours, you can learn. A, 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 a software or a, hard, a piece of hardware, like it's, it's nothing, you know? You have to use your ears. It's not just about, oh, I'm gonna just start turning things. The thing about being an engineer that people forget is it's about how you ear train. You have to understand what you're listening for. Are you fixing something? Are you adding it? Are you subtracting from it? Like, what do you want to achieve? And then when you get to the fun stuff, which, you know, you're adding effects, you don't want to overdo it, or do you want to overdo it? Because it's an artistic choice, you know? 
So, but that becomes fun because that's like being in the in the. You know, I always say like the frequencies and my uh, my compressors and dynamics are like the paintbrushes. It's the colors that I use on a canvas, right? And so that's all fun, but it's always dealing with the people, which is the hardest. And do not have preconceived notions of people when you're getting in the studio with them. That's a big thing. I remember when Gucci got out of prison, Gucci Mane got out of prison, we had a session at her studio, because she owns a heck of a studio in Miami, by the way. But we had a session at her studio, and Gucci pulls up. We're working with Gucci, and he pulls up Rolls Royce by himself. Well, I'm thinking he about to have like how the game came, 50 people and all this. He came literally by himself. He, he, did, he, he let go of all the bad habits he had. His only habit was candy. So he would get candy. But you would sit and have a conversation with him, and you're like, there's no way. I literally sit and, we sat and had a two-hour conversation. I was like, no way this is the same guy that they talk about, the boogeyman and all this thing about him. Very highly, extremely, in, we were talking about books. It was the craziest thing, but the preconceived notion of him, I would have thought completely different to, to actually having a conversation with this gentleman. And he's a very highly skilled, highly intelligent person, and everything he did was on purpose because mm. it was a part of a plan. So ne never take the preconceived notion of the artist that you may be working with until you have time with them yourself. That's another thing besides the skills. The yeah, and talking. I will say also, like, don't be so excited to meet some of your heroes because they, they're they nice. They let you down. So, yeah, because <laughs> some of I've had some experiences where I thought I was about to have the best session of my life. I was meeting somebody that I've been just listening to since I was a youth, and and it was all bad. Like, they are just not – they're just they're just terrible human beings. And you're Facts. like – And you're, you're just crushed. You're like, dang, that's horrible. Didn't think that was – That's, a, that's like, true. Like, they, like, what they – what they want to perceive themselves as to consumers and on the camera is this, you know, they're gorgeous or they're this and yeah. they're, you know. But then behind the scenes, they treat people Everybody. horribly. Yes. So I think that's important for y'all to note as well, like especially if you're aspiring to get into the higher parts of the industry. This has been said, who you meet on the way up is the same people you meet on the way down. So take that as a note, too. You never want anybody to be afraid or, or worried about meeting you in a different light or way than yeah. how they saw you beforehand. And always gotcha. treat the janitor like the CEO yeah. mm -hmm. because they just might be one day. Quick story. We were working at a record plant. She know, she know what that is. It's a spot yeah. in, in, in L.A. Yeah. And the gentleman who was our assistant engineer, we, we called him Michael because Michael, he looked like Michael Jackson, so we called him MJ. Oh, right? wait. I remember the story. Yeah. So... <laughs> Basically, we were working with Jamie Foxx or somebody like that. And the energy in the room, our, our, me and Rico thing was the energy in the room has to be good, including the assistant engineer who was getting things for us. We treated this, this was his first week of work. We treated this young man so good, it encouraged him. We just treated people good because we did. We didn't know how much it encouraged him because he was at a make or break point in his life. We didn't know that. Seven years later, I go back to that same studio as a producer and a writer working on a Rihanna writing camp. The person who run the studio was MJ, was Antonio. The, so imagine if we would have treated him horribly at that point. He said, if you ever need a room and I'm running this joint, you got whatever room you need whenever you need it because y'all treated me so well. And that's when he told me about that was a breaking point in his life. So always treat the janitor like the CEO because they just might be one day. Always. I love it. Oh, I had a question here in the middle. So in any other instances where people were treating you badly, have you ever had to just refuse working with somebody? It was. It never got to a point where I needed to just like you know, do that. I guess you you sort of. I mean, listen. I I, I like I've been crucified by some of the top of the artists in the world. Mm -hmm. Like, and I mean, crucified. Like I've been like you messing up. Like you know, <laughs> just like. It's part of it, right? I don't know. Like, I never felt like I was being threatened. It was just like, you know what? Like, I'm, I'm just earning my stripes kind mm. thing, I guess. Because um, I was messing up. Some people I wasn't messing up, and I was just, they just were mean people. Um, but I, n I could never tell somebody to get out. If anything, I would, I would probably just excuse myself. But I never had a, a situation where I felt like I need, I, like I, you know, 
I felt like I needed to like leave, you know, it was just, I just had to like adjust and be like, all right, how am I going to do this? You know, or, all right, the session is only going to be another day. Like, let me just deal with, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know. Like you just kind of roll with the punches, I guess. Um, and you just kind of decide like, all right, is, you know, but nothing ever crossed the line to the point where it was like so bad that I had to go that route. That's a blessing. But be leery and don't be afraid to say no. Oh, exactly. If it comes with breath yourself. Okay, we time for one more audience question. I know I saw her more more hand. Yes. So what, what things inspire your music style? Oh. Mm. What things inspire your music style? Oh, I love that question. Uh, well, shoot. Well, growing up, let's see. I have been, I, I, I'll go back to um, growing up, little, little old Sella. My dad was playing a lot of uh, Beach Boys, Beatles, Stevie Wonder, Luther Vandross, that was kind of records in the house. Um, so for me, I naturally gravitated towards R&B music and hip hop. It just became like what spoke to my soul. Um, I remember being in middle school and my dad had this little incentive program that if I got an A, he would, uh, like for every A, he would buy me an album mm -hmm. from this company called Columbia House back in the day, oh, I remember where that. I think yeah. like you would pay like a penny. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it was some crazy thing. <laughs> yeah. I let my dad deal with that, the billing on that. <laughs> So I was just striving for straight A's because if I got six straight A's, I got six albums and mm -hmm. I would do it. And so for me, it was um, always wanting to study the likes of Janet Jackson, Whitney Houston. Uh, there was a young rapper by the name of Young MC mm -hmm. back in the day. Eventually it was Wu-Tang Clan. I mean, for me, it's just been hip hop and R&B in my soul. And it's just so crazy that my career landed that way because it did, that wasn't like, listen, like working for a studio like the Hit Factory, and I'm a Latin woman, like the studio manager could have been like, ah, like let me just peg her for Latin music because she's a Latin girl and right. she can mm -hmm. speak Spanish. But it just so happened that one of my favorite artists in high school when she came out was Missy Elliott. Mm -hmm. And the first artist that I had to work with was Missy Elliott. Wow. And my, my career path just went down that path because it was working with Missy, which eventually turned into working with Timberland, which eventually worked into working with Danger and every artist that, that you know, they, they worked with beyond that. So and they worked that's with really what it is. It's just I've always had a love for R&B and hip hop music to this day. I love it. Yeah. So before we transition to our next component, um, I also used to close um, the lads with this question as well. What is the strongest piece of real advice that you can offer any of our audience members who wish to follow similar or unique paths for their music careers? Yeah, um, I, I, I would just say is, is really think about what success means for you in the short term and in the, 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 the long term of it all. Um, and I say that because you have to know in the short term, success might mean, you know what? I got a job at a record store. I'm around music. In the long term, I want to work for a record label. Mm. You know what I mean? And really figure out those two those two points. And I always talk about roadmaps. Road, I love, or a blueprint, right? And I think it's important because as long as you set yourself a goal from, from a small goal from the beginning, all you can do is, all right, I achieved this, now the next one, now the next one. And that's all you can do because a lot, I feel like a lot of kids, they, they get caught up in what's going to happen, like, you know, the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. But the bigger picture can't happen until you start from, you know, the little steps. So always begin and, and, and don't, don't discount the little moment, the little opportunities. Because those little opportunities might be what really brings in the big opportunity. Because you never know who you're going to meet, what networking op opportunity. The people sitting in this room are going to be in five years from now, I might be coming back and doing a talk and then y'all are going to come and be like, oh, I remember. And so on. And now it's like your neighbor. Yeah. You know, it's the people in your city. It's the pe it's it's and now you guys have social media. I didn't have any of these amazing things <laughs> right. and tools back then, but we're so interconnected. But just really set your your mind to what your first, your your small and your big goals are and 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 go from there. And you know, I love it. Oh. Well, we're going to be transitioning to our next segment, but Miss uh, so I can't, I can't Miss Lago. Uh, Marcella is going to be staying around <laughs> Lago. Uh, and chat, and we're going to be here all after as well. So if you guys have any additional questions, and please feel free to pass them along. And you can also hit her up uh, on Incredible Lago on yes. Instagram. Thank 
Thank so you guys, thank you so much for being here with us. Give it up for Marcella, some love. guys. Marcella Areca. Thank you. And for all those watching the live stream, we got a packed house today. It's going down up in yes. here. Y'all should have been in here, <laughs> in this night.